Tonight, deadly explosions rip through Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday. The attacks were coordinated, deadly and targeted. But who is responsible? Quebec calls in the army as floodwaters rise again. And now all over again, it seems like a nightmare. Is the province better prepared this time around? You will suffer the consequences if you burn out. Burnout is a real physical thing. More and more of us are overworked, overstressed, and on the edge, rethinking how we work to battle burnout. This is The National. The single most important holy day of the Christian faith, Easter Sunday, signifies resurrection and redemption for billions around the world. But in Sri Lanka today, it was a day of horror, as coordinated attacks killed hundreds in three cities. The attackers struck three churches in the middle of Easter services in Batakaloa, Nagambo, and the capital, Colombo, where five other targets were also hit, including luxury hotels. In all, more than 200 people died in eight separate explosions. Among the dead are dozens of foreigners. More than 450 were injured. Authorities have arrested more than a dozen people, though they believe most of the attackers died in the blasts. Our Paul Hunter has more on the shock and outrage of the day. Easter Sunday. And the blood, the anguish and horror in Sri Lanka seemed everywhere. Multiple churches and multiple hotels in and around the capital struck by suicide bombers. The savagery seemed relentless. The survivors rushed to overwhelmed hospitals, some on sheets of plywood inside any cars that could make the desperate trip. I heard the explosion, then the roof fell on us, said this man who was at one of the churches hit. We took the children and ran. The churches, all Christian. The hotels, all popular with foreigners. And though authorities say the attacks were coordinated, little else is known of what or who is behind them. <laughs> Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe today toured one of the bombed churches and blamed religious extremists. <laughs> authorities will be given all the powers they want to find those responsible, he said. We can't allow these kinds of crimes to take place. It's been a decade since Sri Lanka's seen this kind of violence. Until their defeat in 2009, Tamil separatists made suicide bombings commonplace in that country for years. Some wonder if they're now back at it. Others suggest Islamic extremists, though radicalized Islamists have no history of such stuff in Sri Lanka. Meanwhile, it's emerged that authorities were warned such attacks were looming. Police got a letter 10 days ago referencing suicide bombs and prominent churches, but didn't alert the government. As investigators now consider that, too, there's a curfew in place, and a number of social media sites have been blocked amid worries misinformation could stir up more violence, while so many Sri Lankans grieve in agony. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. As Paul mentioned there, there's been no formal claim of responsibility, but security analysts already point to some clues that investigators will use to determine who was behind this and the message the attackers were trying to send. This is a completely new dynamic, a new aspect of terrorism that the country has not witnessed before. The country of 22 million has seen so much horror through 30 years of civil war, but this is different. Security expert Sajin Gohel says this attack was not about domestic tensions. It was clearly meant to hurt Westerners and Christians on a day of worship. And when we see a, an attack that is coordinated, multiple, designed to target a particular religious or ethnic group, and also to create economic damage, 
then those are the hallmarks of a powerful transnational terrorist actor. He says the goal seems to be to prey on a country that is fragile in its peace and try to target a country still divided from war. Violence has still sputtered up over the years between religious communities. Sri Lanka is primarily Buddhist, with minority Hindu and Muslim communities, just 6 percent Catholic. Just last year, a state of emergency was declared after violence between Buddhists and Muslims flared. This attack seems to take advantage of those pressures. This was designed to create maximum devastation, the same ideology that we've seen used in terrorist attacks in Europe and in North America and in Australia. And it happens also in the developing world, which, and Sri Lanka is a timely example of why we shouldn't ignore that threat. The violence will reopen old wounds, and even without anyone claiming responsibility yet, it shows terrorism knows no borders. No Canadians have been reported killed or injured in the attacks, but Ottawa is warning Canadians in Sri Lanka that more attacks are possible. And that has only heightened the fear and concern among the Sri Lankan community in this country. Cameron McIntosh has their reaction tonight. Bonded in friendship and faith, Toronto Harvest Missionary Church works in Sri Lanka directly with Batakaloa Zion Church, one of three hit in the bombings. Many in this congregation have personal connections and have traveled there. Angeline Sahaya Nathan's father led the congregation here through an Easter service, rife with grief and tension. Right now we're just kind of waiting upon their safety and we're trying to hear like how are they doing so we're all kind of antsy right now. Under emergency curfew and social media lockdown, getting information from Sri Lanka is difficult. From early reports, some families did confirm the worst. In Calgary, Delina Fernando found out his cousin was among those killed. We hope that the numbers numbers don't continue to raise because every every like minute they're they're saying like the death toll is getting higher and higher and it's just it's just hard to hear. And then I go to my next message, which is from my uncle in UK, saying that you know his wife's sister was one of the people injured. For Ram Selvaraja, a member of Canada's sizable Tamil community, it's been a long day on his phone. Those attacks, he says, strike hard in a community that lived through decades of civil war. And this is especially concerning. You know, we're coming up to the 10th anniversary of the uh, war in Sri Lanka kind of being over. And suddenly, you know, there's 200 people killed on a Sunday church service. At this Tamil Catholic church in Montreal, clergy are alarmed at the specific targeting of Christians. To have such kind of uh, uh, terror attacks and on this feast of Easter, uh, has to be condemned. The services that were attacked were known to be busy, drawing big crowds. This year, too crowded for Kevin Warnicola Surya's mother, who called to tell him she left right before the attack. She told me uh, there was explosion. We are good, don't worry about it. Back at Harvest Missionary Church, it's just a lot to process. Just seeing that just put such a bread in your heart. The scale and brutality of it all will take a while to sink in. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And global reaction continues to pour in as the international community shares its grief and outrage, including from Britain's foreign minister, who condemned the attacks as sickening. India's prime minister and Pakistan's prime minister say their countries stand with Sri Lanka. Pope Francis condemned the cruel violence during his Easter address in Rome. And in a statement, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said, Canada strongly condemns these heinous attacks. No one should be targeted because of their faith. Turning now to a major story here in Canada, rising flood waters threatening parts of New Brunswick, Quebec and eastern Ontario. More than 2,500 homes have been flooded and more than 1,000 other families have sought shelter. I must stress that this still is a very difficult and hazardous situation and we are certainly not out of the woods. In fact, we are, we are just entering. Dozens of streets are underwater in Fredericton, where the St. John River is rising fast. Floodwaters there should peak tomorrow. In Edmonston, the flooding is less severe and should start to subside on Wednesday. Quebec is hardest hit in terms of numbers, especially south of the capital. In just one small city, St. Marie, at least 500 homes are flooded, with the Chaudière River rising by as much as 25 centimeters an hour. Around Montreal, they're bracing for their turn. 
In nearby Rigaud, 25 homes have flooded and another 100 are at risk. Further west, the Ottawa River threatens communities in both Quebec and Ontario. It's shocking to see that. I've never seen anything like it before. A 72-year-old woman died yesterday when a road was washed out. There is a strong sense of deja vu in many of these affected areas. Just two years ago, they went through a similar ordeal. And tonight, Simon Nakanenshi focuses on Quebec to see how they're better prepared. They called in the big guns early this time. Canadian forces rolled into three regions of the province today. Their mission, to shore up shorelines against rising waters. Some ended up slinging sandbags in their own backyard. There's an excitement because uh, you know that you're going you're to help uh, some people and uh, we're helping our neighbours because we are from Laval. But elsewhere, it was already too late. In the Beauce region south of Quebec City, hundreds of homes were already flooded. Alain Tiverge had to be evacuated by boat. I've got the clothes on my back, he says. The rest of my stuff is scrap, if you ask me. It's probably all floating from one end of the street to the other. In and around Montreal, homeowners braced for the worst yet to come. Melting snow further up north will soon be rushing downstream. I'm really scared this year, yeah, because they don't know when it will happen. It's tomorrow, uh, this night, after tomorrow, uh, <laughs> God, God knows. <laughs> Here in Laval, pallets of sandbags line the streets. Many residents have already put up makeshift flood barriers in front of their homes. This house got flooded in 2017. This time, its owner isn't taking any chances. He's already raised it by over a meter. I wasn't there uh, two years ago as a uh, premier, but uh, I think we all learn lessons. Yeah. In 2017, levels had already spiked by the time the army was called in. This time, everyone's acting faster. Well, I mean, we got two pumps going at 24 hours around the clock, and it's the water's coming in faster than it's being pumped out. For now, Quebecers are trying their best to protect themselves and their homes. Besides that, there's not much to do except watch and wait for the water. Simon Nakaneshny, CBC News, Laval, Quebec. So when rising waters threaten your home, you can face an excruciating dilemma. New Brunswick authorities drove that home today. So we've been talking a lot about rising water. And I think uh, we need to also make sure we don't ignore the fact about rising stress and tension. Some of the leading causes of this stress is people I know torn between wanting to stay in their residences, wanting to preserve their property, uh, set against the need to be mindful of their own personal safety. In Fredericton alone, 200 homes have been affected. The province hasn't ordered any mandatory evacuations, but commended residents who chose to leave voluntarily. Still in New Brunswick, the city of Miramichi is mourning four teenagers who died after a late night crash. We have some, uh, some families who are, are really, really hurting and uh, we are uh, a community in grief. The teens were killed when the vehicle they were in went off the road, flipped over and landed upside down in deep water. The city's mayor was clearly shaken. And my heart breaks for those four young lives lost, Logan Matchett, Avery Astle, Cassie Lloyd and Emma Connick, and for their families. Police say while it's still early, there's no indication drugs or alcohol played a role. And it's a very tragic, um, Easter Sunday that we gather on here today. All of the victims were between 16 and 18 years old. Tragedy, too, being felt today in PEI after the death of a provincial Green Party candidate and his little boy. Josh Underhay and six-year-old Oliver were killed in a canoeing accident just days before Islanders go to the polls. Kayla Hounsel has the story. In Charlottetown, a sign of an upcoming election overshadowed by tragedy. But in this district, all other party signs have come down as a symbol of respect for Josh Underhay and his son Oliver. Their bodies were found Friday after they failed to return to a pickup spot along the Hillsborough River. It was just a shock and very hard to process and still is right now. Mike Connolly knew Underhay through one of his greatest passions, cycling. Great human being. Cycling advocate, uh, all around good person. 
Under Hay rode to school every day. He was a teacher. My only friend was the man in the moon. Under Hay taught Gracie Macbeth social studies and French, but she was also inspired by his love of music and life lessons. Don't judge someone just because they're different, because everyone has um, their own story. She says Underhay talked to his students about the election and told them he wanted to run to make the world a better place for kids, including his own children. He leaves behind his wife, Carrie, and another son, Lyndon. A GoFundMe page has raised tens of thousands of dollars for them in just two days. Because he used to show videos of his kids in our classroom and pictures, and he'd just tell us about how proud he was that they were speaking French, because um, they could speak better French than any of us could. Um, and he was really proud of them. Provincial Green Party leader Peter Bevan Baker says Underhay brought humor and boundless energy to every situation. All parties agreed to suspend campaigning for the weekend. It, it says something about PEI as a province, the people, and about Josh. The vote in Underhay's district has been cancelled. A by-election will be held within three months. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Charlottetown. The rest of PEI will vote on Tuesday as planned. You can watch on CBC News Network starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on CBC Local on CBC Television. And you can stream it too online starting at 5 p.m. Eastern. From provincial to the federal election, in exactly six months, if all goes according to plan, Canadians will cast their ballots. And right now, Justin Trudeau and his Liberals find themselves trailing in the polls. Of course, half a year, it's a long time in politics, and a lot can change from now until October 21st. Parties have already begun testing their messages and sharpening their attacks. Olivia Stefanovich breaks down the road ahead for all the leaders. I will not make personal attacks, and I will not use anger, division, and fear, because Canadians are better than that. This is not the position the Prime Minister wants to be in six months away from Election Day. Instead of defending his record, Justin Trudeau finds himself on the attack. Andrew Scheer has proudly spoken at the same rallies as white nationalists. Is that leadership? Is that someone who will govern for all Canadians? No. I don't think the Liberals are dragging in the polls two and a half points behind the Conservatives. Their steady lead zapped by the SNC-Lavalin affair. The controversy prompted the resignation of two cabinet ministers and Trudeau's right-hand man, who helped design the last campaign and now likely won't be part of this one. Certainly for the Liberals, they do have enough time to turn things around, but it's unusual for an incumbent government to be behind after just one term in power. Historically, prime ministers who have found themselves trailing in the polls this close to an election have been defeated or reduced to a minority government. This will be both Andrew Scheer and Jagmeet Singh's first campaign as leaders. Political strategists say this is the opposition's opportunity to strike. I don't think Andrew Scheer is yet known to Canadians. I think this campaign will be his, his coming out party. While Scheer is getting a boost from a coalition of conservative premiers, it also comes with risks. The more allies you've got, the more uh, people who can say something, the more people there are who can say something that can land you in hot water. And the Tories also have Maxime Bernier's People's Party of Canada to compete with. Meanwhile, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is trying to get his time in the spotlight. His party is polling in third. He, he will have work to do because still to this day, he's, he's a, an unknown quantity. Different challenges the different party leaders have to address as they count down to this fall's election. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Some other stories we are watching tonight on The National. A man caught in an avalanche yesterday in British Columbia's Yoho National Park has died. Parks Canada says the accident, though, was not related to Tuesday's avalanche that killed three climbers in Banff National Park. And in Colombia, crews are busy digging through rubble after heavy rains unleashed landslides. Officials say at least 14 people are dead and five others injured. Still to come, feeling burned out by the job? You're not alone. Tonight, we kick off our series on how the stress of modern work is affecting Canadians. But next, a comedian is elected to be the next president of Ukraine, and it's no joke. Congratulations to the team. 
with a 72% winning. Chris Brown is in Kiev with what it means for Russia and the West. His only political experience was playing a fictional president on TV, and now he's headed for a landslide victory in Ukraine's real-life presidential election. Vladimir Zelensky's campaign has been anything but conventional. He even started it with a bang, announced his bid at the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve. Many dismissed it as anything more than a PR stunt, but Zelensky insisted all along that his campaign is no laughing matter. And now, despite having few clear policies and being vague about what he actually stands for, he's on his way to the country's top office. Our Chris Brown is at the Zelensky headquarters in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. Well, tonight, Vladimir Zelensky not only rewrote the rules of politics in Ukraine, but all post-Soviet states by massively winning a competitive fair election. He asked voters to give him a mandate to clip the wings of the oligarch class that have made decisions here for decades, and he got it. Volodymyr Zelensky. There was no need to wait beyond the first exit poll seconds after the voting ended. Vladimir Zelensky was predicted to take more than 70% of the votes. On TV, how most Ukrainians got to know the 41-year-old comic, his ordinary man character almost accidentally gets elected president. But his real-life campaign was incredibly strategic, using social media to energize younger voters. In the campaign's final spectacular soccer stadium debate, Petro Poroshenko, the wealthy chocolate magnate who's led Ukraine for five years, slammed Zelensky's lack of a coherent platform. And he said Zelensky wouldn't be able to stand up to Russia's Vladimir Putin. Zelensky has said he'll end the war with Russian-supported separatists, but he hasn't said how. Ukraine's anemic economy was a bigger worry, so voters opted for a total change of direction. Tonight, he gave no immediate hints about filling in details on his long to-do list. There will be no pathetic speeches, he said, accepting the victory. Thank you. This is hopefully a historic turning point where the old oligarch system is finally broken, where corruption is taken care of. It's one thing for Zelensky to win. It's another for him to pass through legislation through a very discordant, a very divided Verkhovna Rada or Parliament. Western nations, especially Canada, were big supporters of Poroshenko. And in capitals everywhere tonight, they'll be wondering how that foreign help fits into Vladimir Zelensky's plans. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Kiev. Still to come, what some banks are doing with information about your credit and debit cards. A BC woman goes public. But straight ahead, our new series, Overworked and Under Stress. Tonight, how we think about our jobs can only make the burnout worse. The problem with saying work hard and you'll be successful is that when you flip it, what you're really telling people, if you're not successful, then you must not be working hard enough. Andrew sits down with strategist and best-selling author Rahaf Harfouch. Work in Canada is changing rapidly. For some fields, the future looks bright. Others are in decline, but regardless of profession or income, so let's see. So we're millions of Canadians have one thing in common. They are stressed. A growing number feel completely burned out for a host of reasons. Fear that technology will make them obsolete. Salaries that don't grow even while life gets more expensive by the day. Many Canadians are simply working themselves into the ground with serious impacts to their mental and physical health. So this week we're going in depth on the problem of burnout, what it means for workers, families, employers. And tonight we zero in on the growing number of creative professionals and how outdated ideas about productivity are actually making things worse. Andrew sits down with a leading Canadian author and expert to discuss the way we think about work. Today, productivity has become an individual pursuit. Rahaf Harfouche. She's a Canadian you may never have heard of before, but you may be able to relate to the message she's spreading. 
we work too damn hard. And in the 21st century, the way our very jobs are changing from the factory floor to the knowledge economy to who knows, we're on a fast track to trouble. Consider this, Harfouche first made a name for herself a decade ago, volunteering on Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. That experience drove her first book, and since then, she's become a New York Times best-selling author, traveling the world, studying and speaking about the impact of technology on people, on culture, and increasingly on how we define work and how work defines us. But fast forward to 2016, her life came to a crashing halt. She was paralyzed by burnout. And as a self-described creative who could no longer create, she had to ask herself the question, now what? Her soul searching led to her latest book, Hustle and Float. And I sat down with Rahaf Harfouche recently in Toronto. Rahaf, very nice to have this chance to chat with you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so, so what was it then? I mean, you, you talk about kind of hitting that, that breaking point. In the moment, I mean, as you were overworking, D did you know, did you realize it was, it was unhealthy, that it was having a harmful impact on you? For a large part of my working life, it was very much focused around this idea that I had to do more and more and more and more in order to reach this success. And for me, what ended up happening was I ended up overworking and then having and suffering from severe health setbacks, uh, burnout, you know, insomnia, uh, not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, losing my hair. And, I, and once you hit that physical wall, you're like, okay, well, clearly this strategy of I'm going to outwork everyone else by doing it harder and longer, that's not getting me closer to where I want to go. And more than that, it's risking everything that's important to me, which is not only my mental and emotional and physical well-being, but my ability to generate ideas that I need to do to keep paying my rent and to keep being able to work. So part of arriving at the point that I think you've arrived at, I think is, is summed up in the title of the book, which is Hustle and Float. Mm -hmm. Can you first explain what that means? So hustle and float is a term that I heard um, from a family friend who is a river guide. It's a whitewater rafting term, and it's used to describe the perfect trip. So the perfect whitewater rafting trip has two parts. There's the part where you hustle, where there's rapids, and you have to paddle as hard as you can to navigate and to make, you know, avoid obstacles and to get to where you want to go. But then there's an equally important part of the trip where you lift your paddles out of the water and you let the river do the work, and the river carries you. And if you have too much hustle, you'll get exhausted, you'll make mistakes, which is quite dangerous. If you have too much float, it's boring, and then you don't really have any control in where you go and where you end up. And I think for creative professionals, that is the perfect way to describe how we need to work and how we can be creative. Right, and, and, and so that's perhaps my next question. Who particularly should be hustling and, and floating? I mean, I think all of us. In the book, I've used the word productive creative as a term because I think that the majority of people today that work in knowledge economies, whether you're an accountant or, or a lawyer or a banker or a teacher or a journalist or a writer or a strategist, we're all being paid to be creative at work. Now that is, that's something that it's a skill set that we are being financially compensated for. So that means that we need to start looking at how to design systems that enable us to do the best quality level of work, knowing that historically all of the systems that we are forced into actually come from industrial revolution era type thinking, meaning it was designed for a type of work that we don't do anymore. So, But explain that for me. I mean, the, the, the tension between being creative and being productive. What's, what's interesting is that when you look at how uh, management thinking developed over time, it's, it, it came really on the floor of factories, and it came around this idea of productivity as linked to continuous output. You went onto the assembly line, you did X amount of widgets in your eight-hour shift, and every single day at the end of the day, you had the same amount of product that you were responsible for producing. And that's how it was for a long time. With knowledge work, we don't produce widgets. We don't produce cars on assembly line. I can't say to you, how many ideas are, are you going to get done? How many ideas are you going to produce in an eight-hour day? It just doesn't work like that. But those were the best systems that we had to manage people. So we kind of took these complex creative tasks. We shoved them into systems that were designed for a completely different type of work. So suddenly, you have this expectation where you have to be productive, productive being continuous output, productive being you have to justify every minute of your working day. You're in a call. You're in a meeting. You're doing the work. And anything that wasn't considered under the umbrella of productivity was frowned upon. 
if you are taking a coffee break, if you're out for a walk, if your manager doesn't see you sitting at your desk from that nine to five, it's considered a waste of time. But what we now know about how the brain works, we need those breaks and that needs to be considered a part of the process and not a diversion from the end goal. So working hard isn't necessarily working smart, but how does that square with some of the biggest success stories of our time? Steve Jobs, a 14-hour workday, just a normal day. Elon Musk making his bed literally on the factory floor. Bill Gates, Oprah, all icons of a superhuman work ethic. And the number one lesson I could offer you where your work is concerned is this. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do that your talent cannot be dismissed. Regardless of how they get it done, I think most people, the science shows, is that burnout is a real thing and that these models of sustained overwork over a long period of time will catch up with you. There will be people who have heart attacks. You will have depression and anxiety. You will suffer the consequences if you burn out. Burnout is a real physical thing. So I think that it's it's very misleading to look at these people and say that, oh, well, like, overwork works, they had it done, because I often think the media only shows us one part of the picture. I mean, I go back to the example in the book of Beyonce, where you look at Beyonce and, and you look, look at everything that she's accomplished, wealth, fame, power, right? But she herself was so burnt out in 2011 that she had to take an entire year off. And I think many times we talk about the light part, like the very exciting part. We don't talk about the shadows because when you look at the percentage of articles that were written about her, there was like so many that were written about her work ethic, so many that were written about how hard she works, how long she works. Very few that were written about the fact that she had to take an entire year off to physically and mentally recover. But I feel like there, there must be a whole subset of people who kind of wear that as a, as a badge of honor too, right? They, they derive a sense of, of pride from the fact that they're working so hard. This is what's the really fascinating thing is that culturally the rituals that we've developed around how we talk about work and around how we link our importance to how hard we work, not even just the job that we do, that's not even important enough anymore. It's like not just the job that we do but how hard and we work at it. Mm -hmm. That goes counter to all of the actual things we need to do to be healthy and to be more creatively prosperous. Like when you say that, I'm thinking, you know, when you go to a party, what's the first question you ask someone? Right? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, and, and so is that, I mean, so to what extent then are, are, have our identities become so, so intertwined with, with work? I mean, you are what you do. I mean, is that kind of what you're getting at here? Most people are working for the majority of their day. So of course that's gonna be the thing that you fall back on when you consider your identity and who you are, because many people at the end of a long day don't have the energy or the time to be able to develop all of these other different parts of their identity because they're tired, because they're working 80 hour work weeks. So to someone like Oprah who says, work hard, and success will come, you would say. And my problem with saying work hard and you'll be successful is that when you flip it, what you're really telling people, if you're not successful, then you must not be working hard enough. And I think that's a very sad message, a very dangerous message, because a lot of people, there are people in this country that will work three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. Are they not working hard enough? There are people who will, you know, who on top of working a full-time job have uh, aging parents to, to take care of, have um, you know, family obligations, have kids to raise, have all these other things that they have to do. Are they, should they be working harder at their jobs and ignoring all these other responsibilities? To me, this is just a fundamental need to redefine what success is going to look like in a way that's a bit more sustainable, a, a, a bit more compassionate. Because many of these people that you, you know, that we talk about are people who have the, the benefit of having a lot of support systems in place, of having the money to be able to maybe hire extra staff, hire nannies, hire cooks, travel by jet, all of these things that enable them to get more things done. I think the average person can't look at that as a standard and then feel guilty and shame themselves because they're just struggling to make ends meet because salaries haven't risen, because there's like wage stagnation, because of all these other economic factors. Instead we say, no, 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 none of that's a big thing you should really be working harder. I saw something on Instagram the other day that said, if you're not going where you want to be in your life, have you considered what you're doing between 7 p.m. and 12 a.m.? This is the narrative that I want to fight against. Not working hard, not dreaming big, not sacrificing some things to build 
important things, but about this idea of what success looks like and what is required for us to, to, to get there, I think there's definitely room for improvement. I think that's a good point to, to wrap the interview. Rahaf, really nice to talk to you. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Lots to think about there. As our burnout series continues this week, we're going to look at how working from home might actually hurt you, how other countries deal with workplace burnout, and our panel of experts weighs in on designing a better, healthier workplace. Tomorrow we learn why it's not just how we work that matters, it's when. New research reveals that burning that midnight oil can have surprising effects on your health even if you're only tweaking your hours. Our health reporter, Christine Birag, explains how shift work affects the body. That's tomorrow on The National, as I sit here late at night hosting the newscast. And if you don't already have enough stress in your life, uh, there's something about your credit or debit card information that you may not know, but you should. Go Public is next. Banks make a business out of information sharing. They actually have services, Visa, MasterCard, and they are paid to share that information. They can't just assume you're okay with them sh sharing your new credit information. Today, worshippers displaced by the fire at Notre Dame gathered at another church for Easter services. So many showed up that some had to be turned away. The mass paid tribute to the firefighters who battled Monday's inferno as well as the bombing victims in Sri Lanka. And Pope Francis delivered his traditional Easter message from the balcony of St. Peter's. He also mentioned the attacks in Sri Lanka and appealed for peace in the world's conflict areas, urging people to become builders of bridges, not walls. Church on Easter Sunday always means a big royal turnout, but today is also the Queen's 93rd birthday. She was joined by many members of her family, including grandson Prince Harry, but his wife, Meghan Markle, who is due to give birth any day, did not attend the service. And if it's Easter Sunday in New York, you're lucky enough to see hats. Fifth Avenue was packed this morning for the annual Easter parade, which is really more of a promenade. Some of the headgear look pretty spectacular. The tradition dates back to the 1800s. Oh, I totally go see that. A warning tonight for the millions of Canadians with debit or credit cards after a British Columbia woman discovered information about her new card was shared with a company without her knowledge. You might not know it, but depending on the card, that actually might be allowed. Rosa Marcatelli from our Go Public unit investigated and found the system sold as secure doesn't always work as it should. I don't like information of mine being given around without me even being aware of it. One call after another. They said that they didn't give that information out to PayPal. No one, not her bank, credit card company, nor PayPal, could or would explain how PayPal got her new expiry date on her Visa debit card when she didn't want the company to have it. It's a debit card that can be used for online purchases. They seem very confused at first. Last month, PayPal emailed Ancuna asking her to update the card information. She ignored the email, not wanting the info online. Then came a second email. Two days afterwards, I got another email saying, oh, we are updated for you, so you don't have to. And I just thought, what? At first, PayPal told her it had a right to her card information as part of an updating program. Financial institutions can give customers new credit card information to businesses, and that includes account numbers and expiry dates. It's meant as a convenience. Customers are automatically opted in, whether they know it or not, and the details are often buried in those user agreements. This privacy advocate says banks need to be more clear about what they're doing. They can't just assume you're okay with them sh sharing your new credit information. After GoPublic started asking questions about Ancuna's case, the story changed. PayPal said it shouldn't have had her information at all, saying Visa debit cards aren't part of the updating program, only credit cards are. Who shared the information and why? None of the three companies could or would explain. 
What we need is people to become aware of this. The merchants who get the automatic updates pay for the service. This cybersecurity expert wonders if financial institutions should be making money by selling customers' information. Banks make a business out of information sharing. They actually have services, Visa, MasterCard, and they are paid to share that information. I'm capable of putting in my information online if I need to. It's not a hassle for me, so I definitely would like the option. We went back and forth on email with the companies, and TD maintains it didn't give the information to PayPal, referring us to Visa. Visa says it didn't do it either, and we should put our questions to PayPal. PayPal isn't answering further questions, citing confidentiality, even though Ancona waived confidentiality in order to allow the company to answer GoPublic's questions. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. If you've got a story you want our Go Public team to take a look at, just send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Still to come, our moment, how the residents of a Saskatchewan nursing home got a few moves on Rocky. guys are probably old enough to remember the last time the Maple Leafs hoisted a Stanley Cup. It was 1967. Now this season, they are Canada's last team with a crack at the Cup. And today, they faced off against Boston with a chance to advance to the second round of playoffs, something they last did in 2004. Greg Ross spoke to young fans who don't remember any of that. You're a generation of Leaf fans who have never seen them play in the second round of the playoffs. Right. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's great. You know, I can't believe uh, they're going this far. But, uh, is it frustrating? I mean, you don't know what it's like. Uh, well, I don't know what it's like. You're correct but on that. So I think it's actually pretty fantastic that uh, we will hopefully make it to the second round. If we lose today, I wouldn't be frustrated. We've been in a drought the past couple years, you know, but hopefully with the power of the city and, you know, the power of us, we can bring it back this year. But you guys, I've, you guys have seen the agony. You felt the agony. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. All the time. For the 18 years of my life, you know, I've been hoping and wishing that the day would come. And you know what? Today's going to be the day. Leafs in six, and we're going to make it all the way. Until now, if these youngsters wanted to see the Leafs in second round playoffs, they had to watch videos. Yes. Yeah. That's the best I could do for to like gain the experience of 2004 and what happened. Just watch YouTube videos and listen from other people that, that have been Leafs fans for their whole life. And yeah, just listen to their stories. DeBrusque moving in on the defense. To David Krejci, back to DeBrusque, he scores! Well, it wasn't to be. The Bruins beat the Leafs 4-2. The series is tied 3-3, and these longtime rivals meet again Tuesday night in Boston. Then we'll see if Toronto's team can carry the entire country's hopes to the second round. But can you guys handle the stress? No. No, not no. really. <laughs> no, I'll have white hairs before. We can handle anything. In Swift Current, Saskatchewan, an unexpected group is taking up the sport of boxing. Seniors, and they're loving it. Their coach is Nick Habshit, and his grandfather was a resident of a long-term care facility called The Meadows until he passed away last summer. So Nick decided to create this program to honor his grandfather, and that's tonight's moment. I wasn't really sure how I was going to approach it, but I, I was really familiar with the Meadows because my grandpa uh, passed away there last year. I wanted to give back and uh, I decided to uh, try and do a couple of workouts with them and see what we could do. At first we were kind of worried about some of the impact that it might be too rough on their hands. So we started with things like just blowing up uh, balloons and letting them punch that. And then we got the hand pads out and saw if they could handle that impact. So uh, they were able to do that and we also got pool noodles for them to hit and then we swing them at them and they'd have to dodge them in their wheelchairs, which was a lot of fun too. So we got to see them improve and in many ways we got to see uh, their strength improve, their mobility and balance improve. We also saw them build their confidence socially. They uh, really liked being there, showed up to practice a little bit early and uh, got a great bond with them too. A lot of times they just want to talk and hang out. It was a, a great way just to kind of connect the community and make everything kind of come around. 
Love that. So it was a six-week program, but they're probably going to try it again in the fall. And over the summer, Nick says some of them are going to come check out his gym and his ring, although they won't do any actual sparring. Love to see that kind of stuff. All right, that's the National for this Easter Sunday. Happy Easter if you're celebrating. Uh, it is also April 21st. Thanks for watching. Good night.